Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. And Horwat, we are just over a week away from the open of Pittsburgh Penguins training camp. And in fact, in a couple of days, the Penguins, at least the prospects of the Penguins, will take on the Bro- the Boston Bruins in the annual prospect challenge. So we have hockey almost here. It's so close that you can almost taste it. It's essentially professional hockey. <clears throat> um, it's a bunch of guys that will be playing in the AHL, maybe going back to their minor league team, but that's okay. Uh, and f- as far as I know, there's no college players involved because of that whole professional aspect, and they wouldn't be able to go back. I think that's why Tristan Braz won't be there. Uh, but hey, you know what? It's essentially professional hockey that we're going to get to see uh, for a little bit. I don't know how the quote unquote tournament or challenge really works, considering the Penguins only played what one or two games last year mm-hmm. and then three this year, but then not the whole thing. Don't know how it works. Not worried about it. We get to see what the prospects can do. And uh, there are some big ones missing, but there are some important ones to uh, keep an eye on during this tournament. Yeah, definitely make sure you watch out for Sam Poulin, Braden Yeager, as they headline that roster heading up to Buffalo for the Prospects Challenge. But Horowitz, we have plenty to get to today, starting with a a player that the Penguins were immediately tied to following the Eric Carlson trade. No longer are the Penguins tied to Thomas Tatar. It seems, according to Elliot Friedman of Sportsnet, that the Penguins are not a team that is interested in bringing in Thomas Tatar at this point in time. We interrupt. This episode of the Tip of the Iceberg to provide an update on the Tomas Tatar situation. He will indeed not be signing with the Pittsburgh Penguins, but he is signing, in fact, with the Colorado Avalanche on a one-year deal. From Avalanche general manager Chris McFarland, Tomas has been a consistent, productive player throughout his NHL career. He is a veteran winger who brings scoring depth to our middle six and can contribute on both ends of the ice. We are excited to have him under contract for the season. The Tatar news was first reported by Chris Johnston of TSN. Now back to the show. Uh, That makes sense considering the Penguins continued to add to the bottom six over the weekend. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Horwat, no Thomas Tatar for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Does this move come back to haunt the Penguins in the future? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. It was going to be a bit of a pain trying to get him in in the first place. You have to figure he's going to – he's a good player. He's going to demand a little bit more than league minimum, even at this stage of the offseason, uh, especially now that he's got a new <clears throat> agency under him. There's going to be some sort of demand there from Thomas Tatar. He's not going to be a league minimum guy regardless. Uh, And we can't afford anything more than league minimum at this point. The Penguins are slightly over the cap, but, you know, rosters need to be created in certain ways to open up the room. Uh, But, no, it would have been a pain to bring him in in the first place. And what Kyle Dubas has done is brought in a ton of forward depth that uh, it won't really be noticed that we don't have Tatar in the lineup. There's going to be a ton of other guys. Maybe certain guys can step up for that offensive punch uh, in the bottom six. Maybe um, the top six does so well offensively this upcoming season that the bottom six kind of can just sit in their role and play defense and then contribute every so often here and there. Um, Anything's possible, but I don't think we're going to notice that. uh, We're not going to notice that we don't have him. Yeah, here's my take on this. It stings that they didn't get him, but at the end of the day, was there really ever a huge opportunity for them to get him? Like, we'll see what he signs for. Obviously, it seems as if he's looking for a contract and not a PTO still, which I think was the story all along. It was just a matter of whether or not his agents were going to be able to get it for him, hence the reason he's probably switching agents. Uh, But here's the thing. When you add a guy like that to your bottom six, it just, the amount of offense that it would have brought would have been phenomenal. But here's the thing. How close was he ever to becoming a Pittsburgh Penguin? How many teams were in that field considering he was the top free agent available from the beginning of August up until this point on September 12th. So it really feels as if, though, yes, it'll sting to not have a 20-goal scorer at your bottom six. I think anybody would say that. But at the end of the day, I don't think they were close to getting that, especially considering, like you mentioned, where they're at with the salary cap. So are they going to miss it compared to what they had already had? No, because they never really had him. 
But would it have been nice to bring in a bona fide 20 goal scorer to the bottom six? Yes, it, it would have definitely been nice to have that guy, not to mention the fact that he'd be able to move up to the top six, particularly while Jake Gensel's missing time in the early weeks of the season. Yeah, <clears throat> it was he he seemed all he always seemed like more of a Jake Gensel fill in anyway, right? It was kind of this perfect timing of all right, the pain was acquired, Eric Carlson. And at about the same time, it was announced that uh, Jake Gensel would be down for at least the first two weeks of the season, maybe more, who knows, probably less. Um, and there needed to be someone that can step into that role to start the year. And, you know, considering Gensel isn't expected to go on long-term into reserve, mm-hmm. it turns into, okay, it just needs to be an internal fix, and we go from there. Yet within hours almost, it was Tatars being linked. There's that. Yeah. Uh, and anytime a big name gets linked to the to the team that you're covering, you're going to focus on it. You're going to look into it. You're going to look at it, mm-hmm. and you're going to follow along with it, especially considering uh, – yeah, Kyle Dubas did say um, after the Carlson trade, there's likely no more big moves. But he would said before that, anytime that there is a big name out there or a big piece that can help the team – get better and succeed he will be around it so it made sense that the that the penguins were there makes sense that that dubas had his eyes on him but it also makes sense that ultimately it didn't go through Mm -hmm. yeah and when you look at the pittsburgh penguins what they have now is a lot of proven defensive minded forwards that have the potential to finish anywhere between five at the lower end and 15 at the higher end when it comes to goals you have lars eller who's floated around that 10 to 15 mark a lot of times in his career you have Nola Chari who at his peak scored I believe 20 goals one season for the Boston Bruins but has also scored sometimes four or five goals in a season so he could fall anywhere in that range same goes for Matt Nieto same goes for Jeff Carter who you can almost pencil in as 10 goals but what do you get with the rest of his game is always the big question so with the Pittsburgh Penguins the gamble is that they all finish towards 15. But even if they don't, and they have a similar situation to last season where the top six is forced to score the majority of the goals, at least they have better defensive awareness and identity as a defense first bottom six. Yeah, it's it, it's the identity that Kyle Dubas has built. It's the identity that probably Mike Sullivan wanted a bit more of last year. It mm-hmm. was... It seems to be that this upcoming year, the top six is going to have to do a lot of the offensive heavy lifting, but that's okay. There seems to be a pretty good group up there that can do it. <clears throat> and then the bottom six will be its defensive mind itself, and that's perfectly okay mm-hmm. as well because um, there won't be a ton. It seems like there won't be a ton of scoring through this throughout this lineup, but also you have to remember they added Eric Carlson. So yeah. that should take care of, <clears throat> excuse me, a fair bit of that bottom six scoring that we're going to be missing yeah you you move eric carlson in for where jeff petrie is and petrie finished with what like 30 some points last year eric carlson finished with a hundred and some and i understand that you know eric carlson's not going to finish with 100 points this season it's it's very unlikely that he's able to to repeat that back to back especially with a team with so many more goal scorers then the, I don't know about so many more goal scorers because San Jose had a, had a good handful of goal scorers and like Timo Meyer and Logan Couture and, you know, and, and Tomas Hurdle. But, you know, a team that is hoping that there is a more balanced scoring attack than the San Jose Sharks had last season. So we'll see what Eric Carlson brings, but that is a lot of points that you're making up for and a lot of points that you're filling into the lineup that just weren't there last year. Not to mention, I think the bottom six, even though they didn't bring in that bona fide 20 goal scorer like Thomas Tatar, I think last year you saw a lot of guys like Teddy Bluger who had, what, two goals. I don't think there's anybody that's really going to be stuck on one, two, or three goals this season. They're at least all going to probably contribute uh, a handful of goals, if not more, towards that five, six, seven, maybe even up to 15 for a couple of these guys. So the bottom six is intriguing, and that's going to be one of the top storylines to follow throughout the entirety of the season. Kyle Dubas decided that he wanted to add to it over the weekend, signing his fourth PTO of the summer, getting Colin White, 26 years old, a speedy defensive forward that has shown some offensive upside in his in his past. But what did you think of adding Colin White to the training camp roster? It's another guy that might have a legitimate chance at cracking the roster, really. 
I know it's a PTO signing and a little bit more unlikely, but it's an interesting decision for a guy that is coming off of a hey, that Panthers didn't win, but coming off of a Stanley Cup run, right? Mm-hmm. Run to the final. Um, now he he obviously didn't contribute offensively to this, but it's more of the defensive mindset that Dubas and Sullivan are building for this Penguins bottom six. Mm-hmm. I as a center, it really adds to the question of okay but we've added a ton of centers already and none of them stand out as the scoring third liner. So how's this going to work? We just figure Lars Eller is going to just pencil into the third line. That's okay. That's fine. We like that. But then you do have a gluttony of options here. There's, you know, Colin White now, uh, Jeff Carter for what it's worth, still there. Nola Chari, uh, Matt Nieto is an option. There's all kinds of names. I'm sure I'm missing one. Like there's, Mm-hmm. We talked about this last episode. There are so many options just out there for the Penguins to just plug and play almost. It'll be quite interesting. And this Colin White edition, it adds adds more surplus to the to the camp, adds more to adds more depth. This is going to be an interesting training camp. Yeah, it does certainly add more depth. And I don't want to come out here and say that he doesn't have a shot to make the team because that just flies in the face of what the Pittsburgh Penguins training camp is about to be, where a lot of people, no matter who you are, no matter how low you are in the depth chart, are going to have the opportunity to move up because of the way that Kyle Dubas has set this roster up. He wants it to be the may the best man win, which sometimes in hockey, the business gets in the way and the best man doesn't always win. See Smith comma tie from last year. But I think the way that Dubas has set this up is any man can come in and earn a spot on the opening night roster for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But when I look at the, quote, organizational depth chart, where I slot Colin White in, I don't think he really does unless he blows away the competition, especially because he's coming in on a PTO and these other guys were signed to actual contracts for this season to come in and earn a a spot. They were the first option for a reason. There was a reason that they were signed in July, in August, and he's brought in on September 9th. So when I look at it, he has to outperform more than a handful of guys. Obviously, you mentioned Nieto, you mentioned Carter, you mentioned Eller, you mentioned Achari. They're all locks, which means essentially there's three roster spots open, which is a good bit for a a team that only has 23 roster spots in general, to have three roster spots open on the forward side of things, that leaves a lot of opportunity for these guys. But for those three roster spots, you have Drew O'Connor, who's position flexible as well. He can play center. He can play left wing. You have Alex Nylander, who can play right or left wing. You have Andreas Janssen, same thing. Vinny Henestrosa, same thing. Austin Wagner, same thing. Rem Pitlick can play left, right, center, any of them. Valtteri Pustin, Sam Poulin, Redeem Zahorna, the list goes on. All of these guys are going to get an actual look at earning a roster spot out of camp. What makes me think that Colin White, a guy that was signed on September 9th, is going to come in and blow all of them away? There's a chance that he does. This is a guy that was signed to a six-year contract with over $4.7 million on his AAV by the uh, Ottawa Senators. Now, it was overpaid. It was later bought out. But he's a guy that has the pedigree that he's shown could eventually or could potentially be a offensive forward that has really good defensive tendencies. If he brings that, then yeah, he's going to make the the roster, but he has to bring that at camp. And it's such a short period of time. Is he going to be able to do that to a level where he outperforms most of these guys and gets one of those three final spots? Yep. That's something we'll just have to wait and see on. I think also the way you say that those top guys are locks, I wouldn't necessarily say all three of them are locks. Lars Eller's just about a lock, I think. Um, and maybe Nola Chari, too, just for the sake of uh, Kyle Dubas's guy. And also, did we mention that trade clause that he has in that contract? Yeah. Uh, Matt Nieto, though, I'm not exactly sure. It will have, I mean, it'll take some time to see. Maybe he is. But uh, it, the way I'm looking at it is there are six open spots, there are guys who have upper hands. But no one is necessarily a lock. And there's, what, like 15 players fighting for these six spots? <laughs> you could make I a mean, case for 15, yeah. You could make a case for 15 players. Maybe even more, because I'd never uh, throw Yoda Kapanen. Or Kapanen uh, whatever the... Kapanen? Kapanen, yeah, because I never throw Kapanen into that list, and I really should. <laughs> but 
you can make a case for upwards of like four times as many spots that there are open. There's going to be plenty of battle. I wouldn't necessarily say any of them are locks just because there's that many options. It kind uh, of outweighs. Like, yeah, sure, you can lock yeah. guys in and give guys upper hands. I yeah. just, it just seems because there are, there's such a surplus of names and legitimate viable options for the bottom six, you can't necessarily go into this camp saying this is his spot to mm -hmm. lose. Uh, see, here's where I disagree with you. I think that, yes, when it comes to actually filling out the lineup, all six of those spots are are flexible right now. Yeah. You could Lars Eller could bump down. Maybe Nolachari looks better. Matt Nieto could look great and be on a third line, or he could bump down and be on the fourth line. But I just think those four names, Nieto, Carter, Eller, and Achari, all make the NHL roster. Where they slot in once they do, that I think is yet to be determined. But, you know, even Matt Nieto is the one guy that you kind of left out in the cold there. Matt Nieto is a guy that Kyle Dubas said, I've been trying to acquire him since I was back with the Toronto Maple Leafs. This is a guy he really likes for the bottom six. And Matt Nieto is a bona fide NHLer. So I, I have him locked in, especially because... He was signed very early, very early in free agency. I have him as a lock personally, um, simply because of the way that Kyle Dubas has spoken about this guy when he was signed and the ability that I think I, I've seen when I've gone back and watched a little bit more of the tape. I still haven't watched enough Matt Nieto. Uh, but I feel like those four are locks, which still leaves three spots open for, like we said, double-digit yeah. potential forwards to go in there and fight for. And that's understandably Jake Ensel's spot is open. Somebody has to play in that role to start the season, but I don't think his roster spot will be available. Like you said, he's not going on LTIR, which means he's going to have to be accounted for on the salary cap and on the 23 man roster. Yep. And that's not a bad thing either. Uh, this is a, that's a good problem to have. That just means he's not going to miss we hope, yeah. a long amount of time. We're expecting to be back within that LTIR range mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the Penguins will have their, barring any early injuries, have their complete uh, roster of players pretty early on. Yeah, well, obviously hoping for health through training camp last preseason, we we did see Teddy Bluger go down. Uh, we saw Jeff Carter miss some time with an injury that was bothering him before the season. So hopefully everybody, once they get up to UPMC Lemieux Complex, stays healthy and can just build for the beginning of the season. The last thing I'll mention about Colin White in particular, uh, the reason that I, I'm not... I'm not saying that he's not going to make the roster. I'm saying he's a long shot. That's the category I'd put him into, mainly because what does he bring that anybody else doesn't? I mean, Kyle Dubas, for what it's worth, has brought in a lot of guys that do very similar things. It's defensive focus, it's speed, and it has some offensive upside. There's some guys that have a little bit more offensive upside than others, have a little bit more offensive skill sets than others. But with Colin White, I look at him and I say, what does he do that, that Drew O'Connor doesn't? Nothing. What does he do that, you know, he's better defensively than Andreas Janssen. That's a bad example. What, but what does he do that Matt Nieto doesn't do? Nothing. So he doesn't have that leg up. He doesn't have that separating factor. So he's going to have to outperform these guys. Drew O'Connor, you know, Alex Nylander, um, particularly a guy like maybe Rem Pitlick. He's going to have to outperform them in camp uh, because there's nothing in his skill set that sets him apart from these guys, in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's 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 a bunch of the same, and this goes for many of the signings too. Colin White just among them, just the defensive forward that is added to the surplus that this bottom six might have uh, mm -hmm. options for. <clears throat> it'll be curious. It'll be interesting to see, and I'll be curious to see exactly what happens with these PTOs in particular. I mean, when you sign a PTO, it's it's a very interesting position to be in. Last one that I can remember is i forget who we had last year if we had anyone uh but, you know brian boyle comes to mind right away and he earned a roster spot out of necessity at first but then remained consistent and was able to play in the lineup almost every night this time around we have four options the penguins yeah. have four options to pick from uh and that'll be quite the battle for all four of them. I think mm -hmm. all four of them have a legitimate shot of cracking some kind of roster here. It's just a matter of where it, where it ends up being. I think Libor Hayek could make the AHL roster like that. It's but who knows exactly what happens with, and the whole the talking about the defense in this same sort of situation is a whole nother conversation that we could have mm -hmm. at another time. I mean, yeah. it's 
also uh, we thought the log jam was a little was relieved when it came to adding Eric Carlson and moving out Petrie and Ruda yet it's gotten filled again with with a couple PTOs but mm-hmm. in at least in one of those PTOs someone who could legitimately make the roster and make a guy like Chad Ruedel pretty expendable yeah yeah I'm writing that down because we're talking about that on Thursday defensive log jam and how it's changed just 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 mental note there because i i think it's changed very 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 much um and i don't think there's actually a log jam there i think there's bodies but i i, I think that the contracts that, we'll talk about it we'll talk about it horror but we're gonna take a quick break when we return is ricard raquel headed for a regression we'll discuss that after the break Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. Shout out to everybody that follows us on Facebook because we have 1.2 thousand now. I I didn't know we we blew past 1,000 followers on Facebook. That's great, but also just got past 1,000 followers on Twitter as well. And not to mention, Horwat, we are less than 10 subscribers away on YouTube at Inside the Penguins from hitting two thousand so thank you to anybody who has followed along anybody that has read listened watched anything at all thank you so much for joining us on this journey and hopefully we have a really great season to talk about it's certainly going to be an exciting one do you i was thinking about this the other day do you believe that the inside the penguins website is about to technically be part of its third season (laughs) okay well it's a stretch that's a stretch because inside the penguins launched as a website the day of game one of that New York Rangers series two years ago. So yeah, sure. Three parts of three seasons is certainly, uh, certainly the way you could bill it, but realistically the second actual season of inside the penguins and the fifth season of the tip of the iceberg, which we roll on right now talking about Ricard Raquel when acquired in 2022 Raquel joined the penguins pretty seamlessly. I think it was evident early on that he was going to fit in here with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He scored 13 points in 19 games to end that season. Who knows what would have happened in that Ranger series we just mentioned if he would have stayed healthy and not been concussed in game one, period one, and not be able to return most of the series. Last season, he comes in with his first full year, signing a really long-term extension, six years, $5 million, and he scores 60 points, 28 goals, 32 assists, his best numbers since 2017-18, so why, Horwat, do I have the sneaking suspicion that he's headed for regression in 2023-24? Do you agree with that statement before I get into why I believe that that's where he's looking at? Uh, no, I don't agree. It just okay. depends okay. on how you're looking at regression, I guess. Are you thinking it's... Numbers-wise. That's yeah. that's what I'm looking. I think that he's not going to touch the stat line that he had last season. I don't think he gets to 60 points, and I don't think he gets to 28 goals. But I think this is kind of where I fall into it. Do you believe he falls below some of the numbers that he was having before getting here? Like uh, in the in the season that he was traded, he had a total of forty one points. Do you think it falls below that? What this no. is the stuff I'm sure you'll describe. What kind of regression are we talking about? Yeah, I think the biggest reason for regression here is what you don't really think of is Ricard Raquel as a power play specialist. But last year. Ricard Raquel on the power play had a career high 11 goals, 11 goals on the power play. I don't know what the first power play is going to look like. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, but something tells me there's a chance that Ricard Raquel is one, not going to be on it a lot more than he was last year. I think he's going to be on it a lot less. In fact, and two, when he's on the power play, how often are they going to defer to Ricard Raquel on the left side? Cause that's where he'd play if he is there. With Carlson, Malkin, Crosby, Gensel when healthy, how much are they really going to utilize Ricard Raquel? I understand that in a power play, you need to use everybody or else you're basically deferring the actual power play because then it'd it'd be four on four. But I do think that there's a, a good chance that he's not even out there on the top unit. And I think that is the main reason for regression because when you look at last season, he had... 11 goals. I believe he had 10 assists for 21 power play points. 20 That's a third of his points came on the main advantage. If you take that away, or even if you cut that in half, 
That gets him from 60 down to 50, and that changes the outlook of his overall counting stats. And that's where I think there's going to be a regression. Do I think he's going to play poorly? No. I still think he's going to be one of the best players on the Pittsburgh Penguins. But I'm just saying, compared to what you saw last season, I think you're going to see a more tame version of Ricard Raquel in 2023. And that's where I jump in to respond. Yeah, you're right. It's... um... I can understand that. I can see a minor setback just because of those power play numbers. And you're right. He was, I don't want to say shockingly good on the power play, but he was very productive uh, for the Penguins and one of the more important pieces for that, <clears throat> for that unit. Mm-hmm. Um, on, a, in, on a normal Penguins roster though, like I get he's uh, a first line player. But on a normal Penguins roster, even last year, does Ricard Raquel really slip into on as the first on the first power play unit? Like, is that necessarily a position for him? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, eleven goals. <laughs> obviously, with eleven goals, it's very much so where he belongs. But now going into this year, we have Eric Carlson and all the things you just mentioned. Does it flow through him a little more or a little less than uh, it did? I can understand dropping him to the second too. It's. Mm-hmm. Um, going to be setbacks in terms of that, but maybe uh, maybe it's five on five uh, numbers take a rise. You know, it could, maybe it stays even somehow. Yeah, I mean, there is a chance. I do think that he'll see more time with Crosby at five on five this season. I think the reason that you saw him spend about, I mean, it, it's it's pretty down the line, like 60-40 Crosby, 60% of the season with Malkin, 40% of the season. Then there was about 100 minutes of ice time that he played with neither of those two, which is pretty much that little experiment on the third line. But he played 631 minutes with Sidney Crosby at 5-on-5 five five and 437 with Evgeny Malkin. The numbers with Crosby and his line are so impressive that the only reason you could tell that he was taken off that line was to try to help bolster the Malkin line and then also to give Brian Rust an opportunity to get back to his game alongside Sidney Crosby. This season, I think, one, I think Brian Rust is going to be better anyway. And two, I think when I look at this, I think Crosby's going to have more time with Ricard Raquel. And I think that that line, especially when Jake Gensel comes back, is going to get back to the levels that they were at last year, which is 55% of the shot attempts, which is 58% of the expected goals and 58% of the scoring chances, which is really solid numbers for any line, in particular for the Penguins' first line. I think that he's going to spend more time, probably closer to 80% of the season with Sidney Crosby, if they can all stay healthy. Yeah, it's it's about where it should be. He should be spending most of his season up on the first line with Sidney Crosby, which should boost his 5-on-5 five five numbers. Um <clears throat> and if he has to take the second power play unit, so be it. It's mm-hmm. uh, that's a minute thing, and we're not super worried about his yeah. power play numbers. But if it leads to some sort of drawback in the regression, I can understand that happening as well. There is a small regression that could happen with a Carter Cal. Plus, mm-hmm. let's be honest with ourselves here: none of these guys are getting younger. We're st- the Penguins are still the oldest team in the league. Yeah, uh, Carter Cal just hit thirty. Yeah, he's thirty now. Not yeah. saying that's old by any means, but that's. <laughs> tail end of your prime yeah it's for most players yeah the regression is sure to come in i don't want to say near future but soon enough in the next couple of seasons during his contract that's for damn sure because yes yeah yeah the tail end and we said that last season the tail end of all of these contracts might be rough but at least the early portion uh is gonna be nice uh and ricardo kell for what it's worth lived up to it last season with 28 goals and 60 points. And if he does that again, listen, I'll sit back, I'll shut up, and I'll take my medicine. But I just think that when I look at the the roster, when I look at specifically at, at his power play numbers, like I didn't, I didn't realize that he had scored 11 power play goals last season. That is a significant number. And if he gets taken off that top unit, that number cut in half might be optimistic, right? So before we move on or before we continue this conversation, I want to ask you, who is your all healthy, because we assume Jake Gensel will be on there once he returns. All healthy. Who is your starting five on that first power play unit? All right. <clears throat> so I'd have to go, obviously, Crosby Malkin. I'm putting Latang on the second one because I'm putting Carlson up there. Gensel and suddenly, Ricardo Kell feels like a good fit. But, yeah, uh, you know, 
It would have to be. It would have to be, actually, yep. because no. Jason no, Zucker would normally fill in there for me. Um, but I mean, you're not picking from that bottom six. You're not going to. So, wait a minute. So Jason Zucker would normally fill in for you. They bring oh, in a I guy so. like Riley Smith who has more offensive ability than Jason Zucker, at least more consistent offensive ability, and you wouldn't fit, fit him in there? I mean, I wouldn't put either of them there. I think I think Chris Letang starts there to start the season. I, I think that it's silly to imagine that they're not going to go out there and put the Holler Globetrotter, Globetrotters on ice out on the, on the lineup there. But, you know, the, the, the fact that you said, I would put Jason Zucker there normally, and then I was like, what about Riley Smith, man? Like, are we forgetting that Riley Smith is on this team? Because I think that he could be an option there as well. It, the only thing that I'm looking at is last season. Sorry to, to like steamroll the point there. But like last season, they had two options. It was Raquel or Rust. This year, they have Raquel, Rust, Latang could move over there. You could move maybe Jake Gensel over there, put Nola Chari in front. He's kind of more of that tenacious dog, Patrick Hornfist kind of player. You could put Riley Smith there. I think there's more options, which I think in general means Ricard Raquel is going to get less playing time. But I do think that it's going to be Chris Letang to start the season. Are you playing two defense? I'm playing two defense, but Ooh. Chris Letang and Eric Carlson, there's arguments to be made that both of them turn into wingers more often than not, particularly on the power play. That's fair. And and that's kind of an idea. I just It doesn't fit with the normal scheme of the Penguins power play, and I think that's kind of why I just plopped Letang to the second. Um, and your what your argument for and your rebuttal for the Riley Smith thing, you're right. Yeah, I could make him an option too. I just want to see what he can do first. I want to see a little okay. bit more of uh, the chemistry built up with this team before we immediately throw him on the first power play. He's mm -hmm. a quick addition. I'll say that he's definitely above in my eyes. Uh, Brian Russ getting on the first power play unit. So, uh, I would say you know just for the current formation of this team, yeah, Ricardo Kell probably slots in on the first but riley smith builds some good chemistry mm -hmm. and looks to be a good offensive output or a good offensive producer absolutely throw him in throw him up on the first if we are not rolling with two defensemen i like the idea of rolling with two defensemen it's just not it just hasn't been the trend recently it hasn't but there's one thing that bucks a trend and that's bringing in a hall of famer and eric carlson to run your power play i think that bucks a trend and i think todd reardon is going to i mean Honestly, if you're a coach there and you're saying, hmm, the five best players I can put out on the ice are Crosby, Malkin, Gensel, Carlson, Latang, and just say, hey, go score a goal. If I'm a coach, that, that feels like a free space to at least try that first. So I, I think that that's in there. And not to mention the fact that Ricardo Kell played a lot of power play time last year because Brian Russ just didn't have it. Um, so it, honestly... I do see that Raquel's numbers regress. I don't think his, his performance regresses all that much. Uh, it might, but I think the regression is really going to come because he doesn't play on the power play. Not only that, but once Gensel gets back, we all talked about how last season Gensel struggled and scored 36 goals. That's not going to happen again. That's not going to happen a second straight year. When he comes back, he's not going to struggle, and there's only so many goals to go around. So unless somebody like Sidney Crosby is going to defer and start becoming more of a playmaker again even though in in recent seasons he started to really get back into the goal scoring groove i think that ricard raquel specifically his goal number is not going to get to 28 but i don't know if his points get to 60 because of that missed power play time that i, I do predict that he's going to have but uh that's it's just my opinion and i'm sure people will disagree with it in the comments which is fine it is what it is and i can understand where you're coming from with it it's a small regression that will be noticeable, but shouldn't affect the team in, an, in any sort of overall way. Mm -mm. No, it's just a different role for him. Mm -hmm. Because last year, I mean, Rust was struggling. Gensel was in a weird pseudo, like, middling, but still scoring Funk. 36 goals. Funk. And there were times where Jake Gensel didn't score for 10, yeah. 15 18 games at five on five. It was all power play production and all short, not shorthanded, empty net goals. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's going to be a different role, specifically if Gensel can come back and get to that level he was at before last season. If Riley Smith comes in and picks up right where Jason Zucker left off, if Brian Rust returns to being the type of player that he is, and if Eric Carlson is what we expect Eric Carlson be, which is basically just a playmaker and a goal scorer from the blue line, 
scoring 50, 60, 70, 80 points potentially. I, I think that it would have to come at the expense of a guy like Ricardo Kell taking a step back when it comes to his his goal scoring and his point collecting. So, yeah, it's if <clears throat> it shouldn't be anything major though. No, I don't. I don't think he's going to drop to thirty yeah. points um, and less than fifteen goals. I think he'll get. There's a good chance he gets twenty. Uh, I don't think he gets upwards of you know twenty six, twenty seven goals. And if he does, again. I'll be happy about it because that means that he'll be succeeding, which means the rest of the team is likely succeeding. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, Horwath thinks that there's a shocking name that could potentially be sent down at the end of Penguins training camp. We'll talk about who that could be after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. Horwat, speaking of Inside the Penguins, if you go check out InsideThePenguins.com today, you'll see a couple stories down. Horwat wrote something saying shocking names to potentially, or could potentially, be sent down to the AHL to start the season for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Horwat, the Penguins enter training camp with more competition than we've seen in a long time. Yep. Who do you believe qualifies as one of those shocking names that could end up starting the season on the wilkes barre Grant Penguins or could end up starting the season somewhere else because they were put on waivers? Yep, that's part of it. I never actually came up with a name for the story, so <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Have at it, everyone. But you have to, first of all, come up with who would you consider as a surprising name. Uh, names like Andreas Janssen. Did I get it right that mm -hmm. times? I know I've messed it up before. Mm-hmm. Um, names like obviously redeems the horn of any hit of Stroza. Uh, guys like them wouldn't that's not, shocking. that's not shocking that's almost what they're expected to do at this point um, but when you look at it does a name like and I mentioned it earlier Matt Nieto would definitely be a shock am I right mm -hmm. would I think even Alex Nylander at this point would maybe be a little surprising considering yeah, he, did, he did sign the one way deal and when he signed it which I know you're you're all over it yeah, signed him before we had a GM. Yeah. That's a big name that maybe – it last season, obviously not. It's not a surprise at all. But this year, yeah, I could see that being a bit of a surprise. Drew O'Connor, despite, you know, that's a possibility. Again, that would be a surprise one, to me. That would be a big shock. So any of those names – and this works out into a couple of different ways just because depending on how you drop the roster right now <clears> – <throat> certain lineup variations the penguins are over the salary cap limit mm -hmm. uh, so you have to drop some sort of name some sort of contract just to get under and it just depends on who it is i mean rem pitlick i don't necessarily think would be surprising to start in the minors but he makes over a million dollars so yeah that's a surprising contract to send to the minors yeah. so i think that's pretty much where it was coming from. Just don't be surprised if someone that you would project to make this opening night roster, like this whole, the whole first conversation we had in this episode, don't be surprised if any of those names, or it'll be surprising if any of those names start the season in uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton or have to take, have to be sent through the waiver wire. Dubas already said yeah. he isn't afraid to use that if he needs to, to clear the space and create the right roster for the scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the bigger surprise, I mean, Drew O'Connor would be the biggest surprise at forward. I, I really think that he's going to have a really good season. I think that the Penguins are hoping for him to have a really good season. So I'd be surprised if he came into camp and he lost out on all of those roster spots and ended up being sent back down to the AHL. Now, there is that isn't the realm of possibility because he only played 46 games in the NHL last season. He played over 20 at the AHL. So there's a chance that he does end up getting sent back down and they say, you know what, you're just not not quite ready yet. We have other players that are in here. It's a new regime under Kyle Dubas, Jason Spezza, Amanda Kessel, and the rest of them. And you know, Trevor Daly as special assistant to the general manager. I, I mentioned the other two. I felt like I should mention Trevor Daly. Um, but I think there's a bigger surprise to be had on the back end, potentially, because you mentioned 
you know, PTOs earlier in this show that could but could make the team conceivably out of camp. Mark Pesic is up there. Um, a guy in the bottom six, by the way, like Colin White that we just mentioned is a, is a guy that could go in there, make the team surprise and could bump a guy like Drew O'Connor because he wasn't expected to come in and be that good. But I think the bigger surprise is on defense. And I don't know if it's going to be one of the younger two. Uh, last year it was Ty Smith and everybody was like, wow, because he performed better, but the the business and Ron Hextall is a, afraid to really use waivers. Kyle Dubas isn't. So if it's one of the young guys, that'll be a surprise. But I think the bigger surprise name to keep an eye out for is Chad Ruedel. Because Ruedel has been a fixture in this Pittsburgh Penguins lineup and roster for the past, what, five, six seasons? Now, with a guy like Kyle Dubas in here that's looking at this lineup and saying, listen, I brought in Mark Pesic. If he performs, he might demand a roster spot. P.O. Joseph is going to be big on the left side. Chad, or sorry, uh, Ty Smith is a guy that's going to command some attention on the left side and the right side. And then Mark Friedman. Like, is there a chance that Mark Friedman outperforms Chad Ruedel in training camp? Yes. So how much does history play into that with Mike Sullivan when it comes to Chad Ruedel versus Mark Friedman or Chad Ruedel versus Mark Pesic? And how much of it is, hey, this is a new era. Whoever comes in and performs is going to get the spot despite the fact that Chad Ruedel has been a reliable option for the Pittsburgh Penguins for the past half decade. It's yeah, I, I think that that would be very much, <clears throat> very much surprise considering the two PTOs and other options that have been signed by uh, Kyle Dubas. It, Chad Ruedel is turning into an expendable piece on this team. It's just the way it is the age, the role he plays. It's easily replaceable with, a younger face and maybe a more consistent face. I mean, that's just the way it is. When this sport turns into a business, you have to put your fan favoritism aside and realize that Chad Rui is basically becoming a big piece of trade fodder. And it's not even like you'd get much in return for him, but um, an expendable piece that you wouldn't notice losing. <laughs> and I was flipping through some of the roster names here. You know, it would be an even bigger shock is, is if uh, Alex Adelkovich loses his job to uh, Magnus Helberg during camp. Now, you, I say that and probably a lot of you just think that's just not going to happen. I mean, Alex Adelkovich did play in the AHL last year for 26 games. He was god-awful for Detroit both years. Yeah, yeah. He, he isn't the same goalie that he was uh, during his Carolina run, his all-rookie team run. I'm not saying he's worse than Helberg, but it's also very possible. Both those guys played for the Grand Rapids Griffins last year, by the way, at one point or another. First of all, hilarious. But second, there is a real chance that he starts the season in the AHL. I get there's also a ton of goalies in this system all of a sudden. We had like mm -hmm. four names last season, and now the Penguins have a gluttony again of goaltenders to choose from. I mean, not even listed on the cap friendly page is... Garrett Sparks. It's because he didn't sign a contract with the NHL Penguins. He signed with the AHL Penguins. Exactly. But there's just names all over this goaltending roster uh, that legitimately could put up some sort of fight. Uh, yeah. For what it's worth, Alex Adelkovich will probably start the season as the backup. No worries. Likely. But anything's possible. And if we're talking about the big surprises of starting in the AHL, I mean, like I, I mentioned those forward names, Chad Ruedel is one. Alex Adelkovich is another. He's it's not unfair to have him in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of this is, is to do with the people behind them, not, not even them and where they sit in the organization. It's the fact that, yeah, Alex Nadelkovich was brought in to be number two, but Magnus Helberg is a, is also a two in some organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and at his best, he could potentially be a two. Chad Ruedel has been the great seventh man for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but, what does Mark Pesic bring? And especially because Chad Ruedel is coming off of a season in which he did struggle a little bit with the opportunities that were given to him. So what happens with all of that, especially considering you look at the Penguins defense? You know, that's the big one to me. I keep coming back to that because that's the big one. The top four is set. That means there's three spots left for five, six guys. And P.O. Joseph and Ty Smith, you'd have to think, have a little bit of a leg up. You would also think that about Chad Ruedel, but Mark Friedman and Ruedel have kind of all been on the same playing field since Friedman was acquired by Ron Hextall a couple seasons ago. So does Friedman overtake Ruedel? Does Pesic overtake Ruedel? Does Libor Hayek come in? He's only 25. Does he come in and show out 
at training camp and get an opportunity to rise that organizational ladder and then sign an actual contract for the season. Like these guys came to Pittsburgh. There's a reason there's four PTOs in Pittsburgh. It takes two to tango. There's a reason that these guys come in and join a training camp with so many other options. It's because they see opportunity and they're betting on themselves that they're going to beat that next guy up. They're going to beat that guy that's in that spot right now. There's opportunity with the Pittsburgh Penguins, which could produce, as, as you wrote the other day, and as we're talking about now, could produce a surprising name that ends up getting placed on the waivers, whether that's Ruedel, whether that's O'Connor, whether that's even Alex Nedeljkovic. It could happen for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll be back later in the week.